Have you guys ever heard of the movie Inception? Now that movie definitely has a fair share of uh, confusing moments, you know, dreams within a dreams, etc. But there's one thing that kind of restricted that movie, and that is the fact that that movie is a real life movie, a live action movie with real people. You know, you're limited with this shit. Get the fuck away, fly. Today I want to talk about the movie that actually inspired Inception. Paprika, made by the genius Satoshi Khan. Yes, the same dude who made Perfect Blue. I made a video on that, on that movie. I want to go check that out too. Actually, it was so inspired by Paprika that there was a bit of a controversy whether or not Christopher Nolan completely stole scenes from Paprika. And this is actually his final movie that he made before he passed in 2010. Let's go golfing! Let's go go- What if I told you there's a browser out there with so much customization options that you can make your browser look like this? Oh, what's that? You want to hear farts every time you click? Or maybe you just want to turn your entire browser into an arcade? Well, welcome to Opera GX, a browser focused on originality and creativity. Now, Opera GX offers a slew of different mods that it's honestly overwhelming at times. You could do so many different cool, interesting things to spice up your browser. And not to mention, if you like anime like me, then you're definitely gonna like this. Now, let me just show you a few of the different changes that happen whenever you download a mod pack from Opera GX. You get different background music. Not to mention there's different keyboard sounds. There's even opening and closing sounds for each tab. There's different themes and colors for your browser. So maybe you don't want the keyboard sounds. Maybe you don't want the background sounds. Every single different mod you could turn on and off depending on what you wanna do that day. And if you visit the GX store, there are a slew, a large, large amount of different types of mod packs. And another really cool feature of Opera GX, one that I thoroughly enjoy, is the video pop-out Setting. Say you're working on something, but you're also wanting to watch a show on the side. All you have to do is click the little video pop out and whatever tab you go to, it will follow you. And not only that, you can move this video player anywhere you want on the browser. Very convenient. And also, if you're wondering about importing stuff from a different browser, Opera GX makes it as simple as clicking a button. All you have to do is go to browser settings, go down to synchronization, and boom, bam, you click a button and all of your stuff from your previous browser is imported into the new browser. Not to mention, one of my favorite features of Opera GX is the sidebar. Maybe you want to listen to music, watch a TikTok, watch a Twitch stream, but you're working on something. You could pop out this little sidebar and watch your favorite Twitch stream, listen to some of your favorite music whenever you feel like it. There are so many different options when it comes to this browser. So do yourself a favor and get Opera GX today. Click that link in the description. You won't regret it. Now, when it comes to the whole concept of dreams and the idea of not really being in control of your mind is something that has always interested and kind of scared me a little bit. Now, I feel like a good way to explain this is drugs. Everyone loves drugs, right? You guys love drugs. But when it comes to hallucinogens, for example, it kind of takes that concept of not really being in control of your mind. You know, the drug takes control of your mind and kind of takes you on a trip. I mean, that's exactly why it's called tripping. I mean, personally, sure, when I was younger, I had a fair share of uh, experiences with the hallucinogens. And it's safe to say that the concept of losing control of your mind, in a way, is genuinely terrifying if, if you let it be terrifying. That's why I always say that that stuff is definitely not for everyone. But what makes that concept even more terrifying is when it comes to this movie, it takes that, you know, the idea of not being in control of your dreams, for example, ask the question, what if someone else was able to control your dream and actually control you in real life through your dreams? That shit's scary. And that's what Paprika is all about. Now, dreams have always been a part of therapy and psychology. And, you know, I'm sure a plenty of you in your past have probably tried to figure out what the hell is going on with that reoccurring dream you're having and try to explain why it's happening. Now, in the world of Paprika, they created a device called the DC Mini, where they are able to look inside of someone's brain and actually see their dream on a monitor. And so they could fully analyze this and try to figure out where the problem is and what this dream means. Because a lot of times when it comes to trauma and other things like that, it's always pushed into your subconscious, where you're not consciously thinking about it, but subconsciously it's completely oh, ruining it's your life. And in this movie, not only was this device able to see inside people's dreams, it was also able to go inside 
people's dreams. You know, like SpongeBob, where he hops into the little dream bubbles. Remember that? Remember that? That's Paprika. And with that power, obviously, if that ends up into the wrong hands, shit can go wrong. And shit goes terribly wrong in this movie. And I want to go through this movie from beginning to end. And normally, I like to just break down characters, break down concepts, and other shit like that. But this movie is so mind melting fuckery confusion that I want you guys to witness this with me and try to explain it as we go along. Because there are so many moments in this movie where you don't know what's real, you don't know what's fake, it's hard to explain a lot of shit. And that's why I love Satoshi Khan's work so much because every single one of his movies or shows all have to do with that psychological idea of blurring the line between reality and fiction. Because as you could see with Perfect Blue or maybe Paranoia Agent, a lot of his stuff always has to do with psychology, which I'm very interested in psychology. And using that concept always keeps the viewers on their toes and makes these movies extremely engaging from beginning to end. Now, if you've never seen this movie, let me just explain a little bit about some portions of it. Have you guys ever experienced sleepwalking or sleep talking? Now, I remember when I was younger, my sister was sleepwalking and she walks into my room and says something and it makes absolutely no sense. And the reason it was so unsettling and scary is the fact that she was talking as if she's having a conversation with me, but none of the words in combination made any sense whatsoever. And me, as a child, I was like freaking out, thinking, you know, I don't, I don't know what the hell, like, she got possessed by a demon or some shit. But that is basically this movie. It lulls you into that normalcy, and all of a sudden, boom, dialogue makes absolutely no sense. You yourself start questioning your own existence. You can't tell if it's your brain that's fucked up or if it's the movie that's doing this. So guys, make sure that brain bandana is on because, you know, it's really gonna confuse you. Because there really isn't even a video in the first place, if only that was the real problem. The video would never really fit in that topic. Or, I mean, maybe the commander will stop copying the paperwork for you, even though I've been on his good side. It's not like anyone really does any work around here. We should get that sheep over there to overhear this conversation before it's too late. You guys ever saying? You know what I'm saying. You guys get what I'm saying, right? Okay. The movie starts out with a circus. Clowns. Uh, carnies. People like that. And something about circuses in general always give me the creeps. Not really necessarily the clowns. Eh, you know what? After thinking about it, it's probably just because uh, after watching Midori for my iceberg video, I don't think I'm ever going to look at circuses the same again. Do not watch that movie. Anyway, a man appears who seems to be looking for someone. A traitor. He's one of our main characters, Detective Konakawa. But then he's discovered. And then... He's teleported onto the stage inside of the cage. And then the crowd starts attacking him, but it's not the crowd, it's him. Laura starts sucking him down, and now he's in the sky, and now he's Tarzan flying through the forest holding a woman. Now he's getting choked by a man. Now he's taking pictures of her hitting uh, someone with a guitar. Now he's chasing himself. Now he's in a hotel with a man who has been shot. And then he tries to chase the culprit, and then he cannot, and then the floor gives out, and then... That's it. Makes a lot of sense, don't it? You guys with me on, you guys with me? As, you know, after after that, you understand what's happening, right? So anyway, we find out, obviously, this was actually us viewing the dreams of the detective who is getting psychotherapy by a woman known as Paprika. She is using the brain sucky device known as the DC Mini that can obviously view one's dreams. And this device is being used for psychotherapy reasons. Because when you look at the dream we just witnessed, you could break it down in, in a way like, for example, he called the man on stage a traitor, but that man happened to be him, you know, inside the cage. And then he starts getting chased by people who look like him, which could easily be shown as him feeling guilt for something he did in his past, and he hates himself for it. He finds himself to be a traitor. And also, in the end, that concept where he's trying to catch someone and the floor, like, uh, you know, falls from underneath him and he can't catch up, that's something that happens all the time in people's dreams. But what I'm trying to say is a lot of dream shit can be broken down with real-life shit. And we are now instantly thrown into the main conflict of the movie and our main cast of characters. They're speaking on the phone talking about how one of the DC Minis have been stolen, which is obviously a big problem. Because the DC Mini that was stolen is one without a limiter, and that limiter is the thing that keeps people from jumping into other people's dreams, and now someone else has it. And it starts to become apparent how serious this issue is pretty quick. 
as Dr. Shima starts speaking to the chairman about the issue at hand. Now, the chairman believes the thief to be Paprika, you know, the woman that was with Detective Konakawa. And then, all of a sudden, Dr. Shima just kind of starts ranting. And this is the first moment in the movie that really gave me, like, whiplash and confusion and really set the tone. Now, don't get me wrong, the beginning of the movie was obviously really confusing, but this part is where it really starts getting unsettling because he starts speaking normally and then he gradually starts speaking a little bit weird and then he just completely delves into nonsense all the way to him jumping out of a window. Then shown what is happening in his head, a parade of complete and utter nonsense, an amalgamation of a bunch of different ideas and topics pure chaos. Now, Dr. Shima luckily survived that fall. I genuinely don't know how, but now he's in a sort of dream coma. Now, like I said before, this shit's scary. The idea of someone hopping into your dreams and like taking control of you to the point that you hallucinate to the, to, to jumping out to your death. They really show right off the bat how terribly dangerous this is. Now, as all of the doctors are looking into Shima's brain and trying to understand what's going on, one of these little creepy ass, stupid ass dolls turns into someone named Himuro. And Himuro was the assistant to Takito, and those two are the ones who created the DC Mini. They're like the big, big nerd scientist guys. And Tokito was just a gigantic, big old boy. He got, he got some he has some junk in his trunk, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So anyway, they all believe Himuro is the one behind this, you know, because Himuro showed up in the dream. So they go to Himuro's apartment, and um, it is exactly what you expect it to be. Oh, that's good. I see he got the latest edition of Hard Boy. Now, uh, what does it mean by boys? That's the part that concerns me. Um, I really hope it's young men, you know, of age. I don't like, I don't like hard boys boys that makes me uncomfortable doesn't sound right at all so anyway dr shiba who was another one of the main characters of the movie who i didn't mention until now for some reason finds a portrait of himuro as a child and i guess his parents dressed him up to look like a creepy porcelain doll when he was younger then shiba sees a creepy ass doll in his closet that is alive and again shit gets weird she follows this creepy doll down a ladder that leads to an amusement park yeah, of course you know the classic basement amusement park a very normal thing to have in your basement but as shiba finds that doll you know the creepy ass doll she jumps over the fence to reach it and poof She's falling to her death. We've already had Shima jump out of a window, and if she did not get caught by Osanai, she would have been dead. Like, she, she was high up in the apartment building. This is Black Mirror before Black Mirror. So anyway, they start to realize the people who are the most vulnerable are the ones who have been exposed to the DC in the past, because I guess their dream barriers broke down and people can easily hop into their dream bubbles but anyway let's go back to dr shima his dreams uh, getting worse well not really his dream but whatever the hell dream he's in because he is on the verge of death his mind is basically about to turn himself into a vegetable however paprika uh who i'm uh just want to mention there's a lot of confusion with the whole paprika situation we're gonna get into that but paprika was able to save him by melting herself into him blowing him up and he explodes, you know, just the normal way to wake people up. Get inside of them, make them explode. Holy shit, I think I just realized what the hell that was referencing. Does that does that mean that she gave him a head in real life to wake him up and he, he bust? Did he bust? Nice. Nice. Yeah, nice. So I know those who haven't seen this movie are probably confused at this moment as to how Paprika is involved, right? Because, right, the chairman said she was a bad guy. She's the one who stole it. But how is she here helping him get out? Well, the thing is, Paprika isn't a real person, necessarily. She's a personification of Shiba. I guess she uses this Paprika persona to get into people's minds to help them. Now, I'll admit, even after watching this movie, don't really understand how and why she can do that, but she can. I don't know if it's some sort of mind superpower or something. And it's also really hard to consider Paprika not real because she has a mind of her own. She has her own opinions aside from Shiba. She's a part of Shiba, but she's her own person. And also, at the beginning of the movie, Paprika was in a physical body. She, she, was, a, she was in a physical body, and Detective Konakawa 
saw Paprika in a real life setting. She even gave him a card, a physical card. It wasn't it wasn't a dream card. Was that Toshiba? Did she just wear a wig? I leave in the comments below your theories on who on how Paprika is what she is. I'm still confused on it trying to figure it out because all that happens is shit gets more confusing as we move on. And a little detail we get from Dr. Shima as he wakes up from, you know, bussin'. ...that when he was in the dream, he had like a shared goal of him wanting to become the ruler of everything, which they start to realize that whoever is the owner of this crazy parade dream, whoever is hijacking other people's brains is on a delusional tirade wanting to become the ruler of everything. Because I guess whenever their dreams are intertwined with someone else's dreams, then the more powerful dream is the one that uh, uh, bleeds into their uh, uh, mind juices their mind sauce. You guys keeping up? So let's move over to the detective and, and get a little bit more therapy going on. So we learn that the man who was shot in his dream is actually a victim in a homicide case he is working on. He goes to the website that Paprika gave, you know, the Paprika that isn't technically real, but is real and gave him a physical card that had like a, a, a address on there. And we see he enters a virtual bar on uh, a laptop. And so naturally the detective while at work, surrounded by everyone, goes inside the computer somehow and is now inside a virtual bar drinking and chatting with Paprika. I don't know. I don't, I don't understand. Okay. But anyway, let's talk about the really cool therapy stuff because I, I find this shit really interesting. Because Paprika is actually being a very good therapist uh, by knowing what the main source of his anxiety stems from, but she's not blatantly going directly towards that. She's having him try to figure it out himself rather than her just saying, this is why you're having problems. Because instead she starts hinting at little things about movies and how she likes movies. Then she takes him to a world full of movie theaters and that triggers whatever trauma happened into his past. He gets angry and shuts down the dream. And, th and this is what you can consider a breakthrough in therapy as now Paprika realizes that movies are a big trigger for him and she understands a little bit more about what's going on. Again, I said this before, but it is really cool how the detective's therapy is intertwined uh, throughout this movie, showing and analyzing the dreams. So let's go back to Sheba to find two more people being controlled by this dream terrorist. The chairman then bans all use of the DC mini and psychotherapy, which I mean, obviously two people have almost died. So Sheba investigates a little bit more. She goes to that theme park that was in her dream earlier, or at least Himuro's dream that she entered, and oh, yep, there's Himuro. What's up with everyone falling out of shit and falling, it's, Jesus Christ, oh yeah, now the DC Mini's fusing with his head. Can people stop falling off shit? Wait, he's alive? He, dude, how are people surviving these falls? I don't understand. Though so anyway, they bring a Detective Konakawa into the situation to investigate because he's the only detective that they can trust who's had experience with the DC Mini. And this part is so interesting again and is confusing as well because as the detective meets Dr. Shiba, who is technically Paprika, he recognizes her, but he doesn't like call her Paprika. He looks at her like she is a completely different person. So is the only person he's ever met is only Paprika in real life, but it's Shiba? I, it's confusing. Or wait, 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 wait. Maybe when Paprika was there, that was a dream. But wait, no, that couldn't be a dream. Like how could Paprika be there physically, you know, if she isn't real? They were watching his dreams on a laptop, but could that have been in a dream when they were watching the dream, when they were inside the dream? Um, yeah, but anyway, the detective, but anyway, the detective is crushing hard on Paprika, who is Dr. Sheba, so he wants, he wants to bang her brain, but, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of sweet, that's kind of sweet, he wants to bang her brain, not her. So anyway, he has a conversation with Dr. Shima, as apparently him and Konakawa kind of go back a little ways, they were kind of friends, and then Shima mentions that he misses the old days, where they kind of shoot the shit and talk about their dreams in the future, and that one comment leads to him having a anxiety attack in the middle of traffic. Because right now we can see that it's pretty obvious he's dealing with something that he feels greatly uh, guilty about that happened in his past. And it has to do with movies and it has to do with uh, dreaming. So let's talk about Tokita a little bit. 
you know, the really big boy with the thick thighs. He's actually voiced by Yuri Lowenthal, who basically voices every character ever. You, you probably uh, would recognize his voice as Sasuke in uh, Naruto. It's funny because every voice actor, at least in the English dub, is very, very recognizable when it comes to anime. I would like to mention the English version is very well done. But anyway, Tokita, he's the mastermind who created the DC Mini and actually created the whole psychotherapy situation along with Shiba. He is a genius with a childlike demeanor. It honestly seems like everyone in this movie has some sort of like mental hurdle to overcome. For example, Tokita has a very large eating problem. I mean, he also becomes overly obsessed with his work to the point that it is damaging to other people. And he fails to see simple problems right in front of him because of the fact that he is a genius. For example, whenever Shiba starts talking about that there is no way Himuro can be behind all of this, because Himuro knew the risks behind the DC Mini, and it makes complete sense that it's actually someone else behind all of this. Tokita just brushes it off, completely ignores it, goes back to work on another DC Mini, and just causes more problems not realizing the severity of the situation, which causes Shiba to go off on him a little bit. Go off, queen. So let's go back to Detective Konakawa. We're getting more and more of his dream, and we're actually getting the same dream from the beginning of the movie, but from a different perspective, as we are viewing his dream from an elevator ran by Paprika. And the dream we saw in the beginning of the movie is starting to make a lot more sense. As you notice, every single scene from this is out of a movie. There's a Tarzan scene, a scene from a spy movie, a scene from a romance movie, and then finally, whenever they go to the 17th floor, emphasis on 17th, he ends up protesting against it, but she goes to that floor anyway, and once again, it is that man dying at the hotel. And same thing happens again. He starts running, he can't catch up, and then he falls. And then we transition to Paprika watching it at a theater on a big screen. And then he turns to find out that it's actually he is the one who shot the gun. And then he exclaims that it looks like he shot himself, which again is so cool in a psychological sense. As the whole concept of killing yourself in a more abstract sense is the idea of killing off who you once were. Maybe when you were younger, for example, you wanted to grow up and be a like a, a superstar, a musician. Maybe you want to be a football player. Maybe you want to be an astronaut. Maybe you wanted to be a doctor or some shit. But when you grew up, a lot of people end up cutting off those dreams because you realize that they're just not feasible. So you technically kill off your old self. And that's exactly what the detective is feeling. He feels like he killed his past self and that's really what he's regretting. I love that Satoshi Khan chose this as an issue with the detective because this is genuinely something that the majority of people deal with and a lot of people would consider to be something like a midlife crisis. You know, when we're younger, we have all these aspirations, all these dreams, all this excitement. But whenever we get older and older and older, we start gradually giving up on those dreams. Even though it's not necessarily too late, we end up gradually killing off our old selves, our, our old uh, excitement, our old motivation, our old dreams. But anyway, let's go back to the dream terrorist. Takita ended up creating two more DC minis so he was able to get inside Himuro's brain and ask him some questions, try to figure out what's going on. And that was the biggest mistake he could have made. Should have listened to Chiba. So Tokita lands inside the dream parade. He starts asking Himuro some questions, starts trying to figure out what's going on, and he starts realizing that, yeah, it's not Himuro that's controlling this dream at all. Now Tokita's trapped there as well. But then we go back to the detective and Paprika. And as the detective starts spouting off some jargon about movies and, and camera lenses and such, showing that he does have showing that he does actually have a lot of knowledge about it, the parade dream starts seeping inside of his dream as well. All of these dreams are starting to merge into one dream. Anyone who's had contact with the DC Mini, all of their dreams are starting to, to be a collective thing. And the host dream is just becoming stronger and stronger. Longer. So Shiba or Paprika realizes how terrible the situation is, so she ends up going into the main dream as Paprika and trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Paprika finds a tear in the fabric of the dream and enters it to find an abandoned town full of Takita toys and a marble statue of Osunai, 
which I have not mentioned Osanai much throughout the movie because he's been a very, very side character throughout. But Osanai is one of the doctors who has been working throughout this film along with Dr. Shiba and Tokita. And you'll find out why there's like a golden statue of him once you figure out who the main culprit of the situation is. I thought it was Osanai at first, but it's not. Paprika goes even deeper to find herself inside the face of Himuro. She follows the roots of a tree to find the real culprit behind this, the chairman, the creepy old dude in a wheelchair, the man who's been doing everything throughout the movie to halt the process of the DC Mini and shut down psychotherapy, the man who made Dr. Shima jump out of a window, the man who uh, controlled Himuro to jump off a thing, who even tried to get uh, Dr. Shiba to jump off a building as well. He is trying to stop all of them from making more DC minis, so he is the only one who is able to have the DC mini and control everyone's dream. Because that's his goal, to have complete control of everyone through dreams. So Dr. Shiba and Dr. Shima end up confronting the chairman, and then the chairman's like, yeah, uh, science, all that science shit, yeah, it's cringe compared to my dream power. I I am the, I have the strongest dreams. Holy shit! Is this Shark Boy and Lava Girl? Dream, 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 dream. But anyway, yeah, it's basically his goal. He wants to control everyone, become the ruler of everything through the power of dream. God, th this really is Shark Boy and Lava Girl. So anyway, as he reveals all of this, he also reveals that he is made of trees. Oh wait a second, tree people don't exist. This it's a dream. It was, uh, so it was a dream. So yeah, Shiba or Paprika or both of them were tricked. They're still in the dream. So we find out not only the chairman, but Osunai are both involved in this. The chairman and Osunai, I guess, are doing a little... You know what I mean? And God, I cannot describe how much I hate this Osunai guy. He's a fucking creep. Every time he's on screen, it, he's like romantically, semi-sexually talking to Paprika. It's so weird. But eventually, Osanai ends up capturing Paprika within the dream. And this next scene is quite rough uh, to watch. It is uh, very triggering for people who have dealt with SA. So yeah, you know, trigger warning. Osanai puts her on a table as a butterfly and talks about preserving her. I wonder if this inspired Butterfly Garden. But anyway, there's so much to unpack here with Osanai. First of all, it's revealed that Osanai sold his body to Himuro. Remember Himuro? The little tubby, little tubby guy? Not only did he bang Himuro, but he's also banging the damn chairman. And he's doing all of these things in order to just sexually assault Paprika or Shiba. The man's a fucking creep and a weirdo. So he starts ranting about him and the old man. They're the chosen protectors of dreams and how the DC Mini gave them this power to bend reality and blend dreams and reality together. And while all this is happening, we go back to the detective and we're still analyzing his past trauma. We start to notice that the number 17 does have a lot of relevance when it comes to his trauma. The bartenders start to pry a little bit on that idea. And I just want to mention the bartenders um, are kind of side characters, but I kind of like them at the same time because they're like taking the place of Paprika right now and doing the therapy. I guess your own dream can therapy you. I, I don't know. But anyway, we find out he actually created a movie when he was 17 years old, which is why the 17 has to do with his, his stuff. So we're starting to make some breakthroughs here. We find that this film was about two best friends. One becomes a cop, one becomes a fugitive. And throughout the movie, he is chasing his friend, but no matter what he does, he's never able to catch him. He's always one step ahead of him. And throughout all of this chasing, there are glimpses of their past, how they met, you know, different things like that, the interwoven story. And honestly, just wanna mention, that sounds like a pretty cool experimental movie, but a lot of what the detective is going through is really starting to make some sense. Oh yeah, and then we go back to Osanai, who's just doing some weird shit. He puts his hand like inside Paprika and then rips her face open to reveal that Sheba's inside, but the chairman appears inside of Osanai's face and tries to kill Sheba, but Osanai's like, no, no, I want a cop a feel. 
Get off of me, Chairman. I want to, I want some Sheba action. And then the detective's dream merges with their dream. And then he comes in and actually is able to save Sheba from them. And then runs to his dream where Osunai ends up becoming the man with no face. And then Osunai becomes the man that was running from him. Remember the, the, the dude he could never able to catch? But then the detective finally was able to catch the man by shooting Osanai in the back. Uh, and then he does a sick one-liner. We cut to a theater. Everyone's cheering. Uh, dude, trauma solved. So we go back to the real world, finally. We see Shima and Shiba talking. He runs to find Tokita, and then all of a sudden, there's Osanai. Or not really Osanai, but the dream version of Osanai, who is dead, or sort of. I, I, I don't know. You guys know the rules. If you die in the dream, you die in real life, right? So anyway, it seems like everything's fine. Osanai's dead. I, I think his dream body's dead. They stopped the culprits. They stopped the bad guys. You know, the detective killed Osanai. Uh, uh, the, everyone's out of their dream and back to reality. Oh, the ghost gravity. Oh! That's not normal. That's not no oh, there's Oh, they're still dreaming. They're still... Wait, no, they're not. Are they dreaming? No. Yeah, no. So now the fabric between the real world and the dream world has torn and everyone is turning into the dream parade. Every physical body of a human is now g getting meshed and fucking gooped into the parade. And now Paprika and Sheba are both in reality. All right, so now I'm even more confused because she's been in reality before, but now that she's in reality and, and dreams are, you know, the same thing, she's in the real world, but also Sheba is in the real world, but they're not the same person, but at the same time, they are the same person, but it's she, uh, Paprika's in her brain, but she's not in her brain. She's actually a completely different person. <sighs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm confused. I'm a little bit confused. So anyway, uh, just as Shiba was about to get stomped on by creepy Asian doll, Tokita saves her, which is a very interesting thing because Tokita has absolutely zero consciousness or control over himself whatsoever, which shows that he did it out of a subconscious decision. Uh, which is an important detail for later on. Because throughout the film, it has been very interesting how Shiba has only ever cared about one person, Tokita. She's only asked if Tokita's okay, if he's uh, awake, if he's fine. And this is like a pivotal moment for herself because Paprika ends up therapying Sheba. So her her dreamed up uh, Paprika person uh, therapy was therapying her the whole time. And Paprika's like, oh, you could say it. You could say that you like him. And then she was like, no, but I'm going to go save him. I don't like him, though, but I'm going to go save him. And then Tokita eats Shiba. So Paprika and Shima find the dimensional hole that is opened as Shiba is getting eaten by Tokita. But then we see Shiba as a mecha version of herself, even though she got eaten by Tokita. So she tries to unstuck Tokita as she did from the beginning of the movie. Remember? I don't know. Did I mention that? I genuinely don't remember if I mentioned that. But at the beginning of the movie, Tokita was stuck inside an elevator because, you know, he's a big boy. And Shiba ends up trying to pull him out. And we didn't really see the whole moment back then. However, at this moment, we see the whole moment, or at least we see what she is dreaming. But how can she dream if dreams and reality are the same thing? So she's dr so her dream Mecha Godzilla body is dreaming about the about the dream that she had of the real life earlier in the movie. So safe to say, Tokita outrizzed everyone. Detective Konakawa wanted paprika, Osanai wanted paprika, even Shima wanted paprika. But out of everyone, Tokita outrizzed everyone. Also, I guess because Osanai died, it opened the fabric of reality to dreams. And then the chairman turns into a giant naked man and starts blowing shit up. And then a baby comes out of the remnants of Tokita's dream state and then starts sucking all the dream out of the out of the chairman until she becomes a giga-sized version, an even bigger-sized version of Chiba. 
Okay, I'll be honest. I got no fucking idea what the hell this is supposed to mean. So I'm assuming Shiba has some sort of giga dream power and can just suck all the dreams away. Because at the beginning of the movie, she talked about how she can never dream. So maybe since she was like an empty slate, her brain can't dream. She could suck as much dream as she can't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But they won. They won. And I do want to mention at the end of the movie, it's really cool and it ends on a very satisfying note because it ends with the complete solidification of Detective Konakawa being cured in a way. He's walking along with Shima as he asks how his anxiety dream has been going. And then he gets a vision of the man who he left behind when he was younger. And I feel like this is what he felt guilty about for so long is he left his friend behind but his friend told him that there is no need to feel guilty as you yourself became a detective you made fiction the movie that they created a reality a reality created from fiction that ladies and gentlemen is paprika an absolutely brilliant movie that will make your brain turn into goop if you guys like this video please make sure to subscribe please make sure to share it with your friends uh let me know in the comments below what uh you think means the thing of that thing because a lot of it c is confusing and i would love to hear you guys' theories on different parts of this movie because i'm sure there is a slew of different theories you could have about it so thank you guys once again for watching you're the best Make sure to watch every single one of my videos and tell everyone about me because I'm freaking cool. I'm so cool. Bye. Bye.